should be carried away. Well, good evening, BFA family. How are you tonight? Are you awake? Are you alive? Are you well? Are you excited? I'm, I, I tell you what, Xander, thank you for being honest, bro. He's like, uh, we're there. We're there. I'm believing by the end of tonight, man, you're going to be pumped up. Uh, as Pastor and I were talking about this first Sunday night, we were just sharing out of our own personal, you know, devotional lives, because believe it or not, we do have our own personal study outside of just preparing for messages for uh, main service and, and for real kids, and, and we're just sharing just what God has been dealing with Christy and I personally, just kind of in our, in our personal lives, and, and we're just sharing kind of where this message came out of, and Pastor said, you need to share that for first Sunday night, and, uh, and as we've been praying about it, I believe with all of my heart that tonight is going to be a powerful night. I believe with all of my being, every bone that's in me is on fire because I'm ready to preach this thing, and I'm going to try and be a little reserved and not crazy and run around and jumping because that will freak some of y'all out. Some of y'all think we're going back to good times. So I'm, I'm going to try and be reserved and find a happy medium. Is that good? If that's good, can you say amen? Amen. amen. But I'm excited. I'm so excited that I want you to say these three words with me. Look to your neighbor and say, do it again. Look to your other neighbor and say, do it again. Mom and dad, look to your kids and say, if you do it again. Oh, moms and dads know what I'm talking about. We had one of those moments earlier today. Josiah, if you do it again, I promise you, you will meet Jesus. And uh, it'll be sooner than, than what the, the plan is. Well, guys, I'm excited about tonight. Because uh, what, what's come out of Christian and I's personal and devotional life is, is a, a language that's communicated all across this world. It doesn't matter if you're from Brookhaven, Mississippi, or Brooklyn, New York or in China, or in Russia, or in South Africa, or in Europe. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter your cultural background. It doesn't matter your personality type. It doesn't matter anything about you. We all communicate one language that's universal. And we see it. We recognize it. We can anticipate it because it's written more. It transcends body language. It, it's just this amazing, beautiful language that we often love to see. Unless it's against you, then you don't like to see. But we'll talk a little bit about that later. But say this word with me. Passion. That was so passionate, it came out passionately in the speakers. Passion. One more time. Say it again. Passion. It's passion. You know when you see somebody passionate and someone that's super excited about something, you can't help but appreciate what they're passionate about. And people that are passionate about the things that they're doing tend to be the ones that you want to be around. You may have zero interest in what the topic is, but you have all the interest in the person talking about it because they're so passionate. And the beautiful thing about passion is as we go through life, our passions tend to, to shift a little bit. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that because what I'm passionate about may not be something you're passionate about. And what you're passionate about, your, your neighbor may not be passionate about, and that's okay. Sometimes in life we go through different seasons, we go through different transitional points, and, and just the, the passion changes. It's not that the previous passion was wrong or it was inerrant, it's just, it's just shifted. So if it's fine with you tonight, I would like to share some different passions that I went through in my life to kind of better illustrate what I'm talking about. Is that cool with you? If that's cool with you, can you shout out okay? Awesome, you gave me permission, so here we go. We're going on a journey. I remember when I was a young man, I know I'm 27 now, but when I was a young man, my passion was video games, or where are my gamers at? Xander, I told you to be alive and well now. Video games was where is that? Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Sega Dreamcast, Nintendo 64, PlayStation 1, 2, 3, and 4. I mean, all of them, all the PlayStations. I was passionate about video games because it was a different world where I could be someone who I wanted to be. Whether it was an all-star basketball player, which thankfully I became that in real life, or was it uh, just an adventurer going out to slay dragons. It didn't matter what it was, I was passionate about video games. But as I got older, I became passionate about dolphins. Don't know why, but I knew that my life was going to be training dolphins at Discovery Cove. I became passionate about marine biology. So I began to study mainly dolphins and how I could train and how it was going to be awesome. I was going to do front flips and back flips and side flips and all sorts of flips with dolphins. It was going to be great. Well, as life continued to move on, I became passionate about coaching basketball because I realized I didn't have a career in basketball. So I became passionate about coaching. And I just thought, how awesome would it be to lead a team to a championship? How awesome would it be to go to the States and, and win more than one game in a season? How awesome would that be? That would be great. And as I got even more passionate, I discovered I was, I was kind of passionate about women. You know, that's, that's a good thing, y'all. We can celebrate that. And, and as I became passionate about women, I discovered, you know, women aren't necessarily interested in the macho men. Sometimes they like a man of the arts. They like a man that has some classical class, if that you can say that about themselves. So I learned how to play an instrument known as the piano because, let's get real, it does not get more romantic than a piano. On all the ladies said, 
Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for that participated. So before I was saved, before I gave my life to Jesus, I knew that I had to learn the one song that every single woman fell in love with. I, I hear you. I hear you, Nikki, but I can't stop. You can't stop this train. One song that every woman fell in love with that melted their heart because it came from the most passionate movie of all time, sung by the famous singer Celine Dion. How many of you guys know where I'm going? You ladies know where I'm going? So I, I, I got to illustrate. I got to illustrate. So I'm going to come over here, and uh, we're going to take a trip down memory lane, and we're going to try and figure this out. Now, for your pleasure, I will not sing because that's not good for anyone, all right? But I remember being in high school my ninth grade year, and I saw a guy, I believe his name was Eric. He was a senior in high school, and man, he had all of the ladies, which is what I wanted to be. And I remember walking into keyboard class one day, and he started. And all the ladies said... Oh, that's right. You can get all. You can get all. I promise we're going to get back to Jesus. And I remember being in that moment thinking, i got to be like that. So I became passionate about learning about this. And we fast forward a couple years. I get passionate for, in my opinion, the only thing that, that should, that's like number one. We can have a whole bunch of twos, threes, fours, and fives. But the number one thing that I needed to be passionate about in my life was Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. That's right. I, I got passionate about Jesus. I got passionate about what he wanted to do in my life and where he was going to take me and, and how my plan was not going to be a coach. It was not going to be a dolphin trainer. It was going to be something bigger. It was going to be something better. It was going to be something greater because I wasn't doing it for me. I was doing it for Jesus. Now, I remember one night many, many years ago. This is almost 11 years ago, Pastor. This was uh, right at the beginning of a pastor uh, starting the lead, taking the charge at BFA. And, and you guys remember Big Vic was playing piano, and the piano was over here at this time. And, and this was right when they saw that I could play piano, but I didn't know Jesus' music. And, and Big Vic was like in the moment, the Holy Spirit was working in his life. And I'll never forget, he was sitting in this chair, and he looked at me, he pointed, <laughs> made eye contact, and did this number right here. If y'all know Big Vic, you know that finger. He just did this number right here, so I, you know, in the moment, just go and I walk up and I, I sit next to him. And he says, I need you to play piano because Holy Spirit's working in me. So you need to sit here and play. Big Vic, I, I, don't, I don't know Christian songs. Whatever you do, don't play the, the Titanic. Everybody say Titanic. Don't play the, y'all, I was freaking out. I was a little nervous. I remember sitting there, and I remember it just like it was yesterday. I had to have been there for at least three minutes. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit's not dependent on that playing piano. But I remember sitting here, and I was getting nervous. My hands were shaking, and I was looking around, and I knew there was an expectation on me to play, and I just got so nervous. I just started. Not even playing. And I emphasized, prayers got better. And revival broke out. Y'all, I'm not even playing. I'm not even playing. I was so nervous, but I was still passionate. And granted, I probably should not have played, but the Holy Spirit used my ignorance anyway. Passion was there. I didn't, I didn't have theology. I didn't have chords. I didn't have an understanding of, of what to play, what not to play, how loud to play, how soft to play. I had nothing except passion to help get me through. And thankfully, the Lord can use passion. Amen? <laughs> I have to believe with all my heart that the Lord would rather help cultivate passion than deal with apathy doing the thing you're supposed to do because it's the thing you're supposed to do. I have to believe that the Holy Spirit would rather kind of shaping and molding passion inside of me, even though I'm not playing a Christian song. I mean, our heart did go on to Jesus that night. It was amazing. We had fun. But you can take that passion and mold it and shift it and funnel it in the right direction versus just coming and sitting and maybe playing hymn number 52 out of the book because that was what was expected. I have to believe passion is a key element in our life. And if you look at your life, you can see areas where you've been passionate too. You see areas where your life, you are super passionate about things, and that's amazing. I applaud that because to me, one of the greatest things in this life is passion because passion makes life fun. Passion makes life joyful. Passion is what moves us 
forward. If you think about two people, one person doing something because they have to do it, and another person doing something because they absolutely love to do it, which one's more fun to watch? The second one, right? How many guys would like to watch tennis with Serena Williams just going? And on the other side, that is the most boring game ever, right? We love the, the passion in it. Passion is great. Passion is amazing. Passion is what the Holy Spirit uses inside of us to reach other people. Pastor Chris Huffman says it this way, passion is contagious. Passion is infectious. If you're ever around a passionate person, it just has a way of getting in, inside of you and drawing passion out of you. It's amazing. It's wonderful. You're thinking, Matt, what on earth does that have to do with tonight? What on earth does that have to do with going deeper? It has everything to do with going deeper. It has absolutely everything to do with going deeper. Because tonight you came in with two expectations. You either came in believing God was doing and uh, willing and able to do the miraculous, as Pastor said, that a limitless God wanted to invade your life and, and take you to a deeper place. Or you came because you're just going to check off. And I promise you, if you came for the first one, you're going to get exactly what you're looking for. If you came for the second one, you're going to get exactly that check mark and walk out. See, the Holy Spirit's not the one that changes, it's us. How we receive him is how we're going to let the Holy Spirit take us to a deeper place. We can't come and say, Lord, take me deeper. I don't like that song Christie's singing, Lord. But I really want you to do a miracle. I believe in you. Right? No, that's, that's, that's not how that works. And that's not how any of this works. And believe it or not, Scripture talks about this very thing. Scripture deals with, with the subject of passion. And going through our devotional life that I was sharing earlier, this is where the Holy Spirit really drew something out of us. Because I didn't see it in this light before. And the Holy Spirit began to, to reveal something for me. So are you guys ready to go? Are you ready to go deeper? Say, I'm ready if you're ready. I'll say it like you mean it. Say it passionately. Say, I'm ready. I'm ready, I'm ready too. In Revelation 2, see, some of y'all thought we were going somewhere else. Mm, in Revelation 2, we have God speaking through John, the Revelator. And in this message, he's writing to the church of Ephesus. And it says this in verse 1. It says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. So far, so good. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. That's pretty good. In verse 4 it says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. In verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Now, at surface value, that, that's, I mean, that's good. But I think we need to understand a little biblical history to know what's being talked about here. Because it's so easy, like how I did, just read over five verses in Revelation chapter 2 and completely miss what God's trying to speak here. Because at first off, if we go back to verse 1, he's talking about the church in, in Ephesus, right? Now check this out. The city of Ephesus is in, at this time recorded to be in the fourth largest city in the world. I mean, this city is huge. It is known as one of the seven wonders of the world. It is a huge, huge city. And Acts 19 refers to Paul actually going into the city and finding some disciples. And he finds these guys and he says, hey, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And they're like, no. He said, well, what, how have you been baptized? Well, we've been baptized in John's baptism. Okay, great. Look, i got to get you filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to go change this city. That's just Matt Taylor abbreviation. And so they're like, okay, let's go. So these guys, not having any theology, not having any Bible school, not having any district school of ministry, not any pastor's training, they get filled with the Holy Spirit and their passion drives them to go into the fourth largest city of the world and over the period of months and years this city is transformed and this church of Ephesus goes into one of the largest churches in the world's history. How awesome is that? It didn't start because of Bible college, it didn't start because of Desam, it started through the power of the Holy Spirit and one word known as passion. 
passion. So when we go back to Revelations 2, 1, and we read this letter again, I want you to kind of read it through this lens now that you know that this, this letter is written about 43 years after the church was started. So to the angel in the church of Ephesus, right, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. These are all good things. These are all great things. If churches aren't doing this, then there's a problem. We need to get false doctrine out of the church. We need to get people who are claiming to be men of God that are not men of God out from the platform because they're leading people astray. These are good things. But the Lord says this, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at, the love you had at first. The love they had at first was Jesus. Church of Ephesus didn't have a, a building program they didn't have a marketing campaign. They didn't have the social media. They didn't have Facebook of Jerusalem. You know what I mean? They, did. they wasn't in Asia at this time. They, all they had was a passion for Jesus. And it seems that over time, over 43 years, they get caught up doing good things, doing great things. But they forsake the love they had at first. And I find it interesting that this is what the Lord is chastising them about. Guys, you're doing great. But you're missing the mark. But I think that shows the heart of the Father, doesn't it? Doesn't that show us the heart of God? Where he's really interested? That, that although we can do some really, really good things, we can do some awesome checkoff lists, we can do our churchly duties, our Christian duties, we can do these things, and not be passionate, and it's okay. But God's heart's not satisfied because God desires our passion. He desires our heart. He desires us to, to go after him with everything, with reckless abandon. And I think just how it was for the, the Ephesian church, as it is in my life, and I think it's in all of our lives, that it's so easy to get caught up in doing a good thing. I know I have to guard my heart and I have to watch myself because sometimes it's easy just to wake up and make sure Josiah gets in the bath and make sure Stephen gets a bath and make sure we get ready and make sure we get out the door and make sure we come and make sure we get set up. And it's easy to do a process, to do a checklist, to do things that we're supposed to do, doing good things, and forget why we're doing it. It's important to remember the why. It's important to remember the passion because if we don't have the passion, we can't drive forward. We don't have the passion. We don't have the heart of the Father. It's all about that one word. And that one word is passion. It's interesting. I am, I'm interested and intrigued that there are three things mentioned in this passage of Scripture. In three areas where I think we as a church need to say do it again. I think the first place is do it through our city. Or in our city. God, do it again in our city. What does that do it again? To see God do an outpouring, to see God do a great move, to see God pour out like he did in Ephesus. I think we need to ask him to do it again in our city. Now, Brookhaven may never be the seventh wonder of the world, but it is the home seekers paradise. It is on the side. I don't know if you guys see that, but I believe God has positioned our city in our state for such a time as this. I have to believe that God put every single person in our church, in our family, and if you're a guest here tonight, this is a message more entitled for, for us as a, as a homebody, so don't feel excluded in this, but this is more of a challenge for us as Brookhaven First Assembly family, those that call BFA home. I think God has positioned you here for such a time as this, for a purpose in this, to let your passion overflow for our city to be changed, because I believe with all of my heart that as pastor said that we serve a God of the impossible, a God according to Ephesians 3.20, when Paul wrote to the Ephesians church that we serve a God that is limitless, a God that, that has no limits on that Brookhaven, Mississippi can be the catalyst of change in our state and in our nation and in our world, but it all starts with us. It starts with us. I believe that he can change our city. I believe 
with everything in me that our city can be changed. In fact, it's primed and ready to be. You know, it's one thing to live in a city that, uh, as amazing as Brookhaven is, to see the, the trend. If we look back 50, 60, 70, 80 years, there's been a shift. There's been, it's been a culture shift. We see more crime. We see more hurt. We see more poverty. We see more brokenness. And Scripture says that a light shines brightest when it's dark. We are primed and ready. People aren't looking for church as usual. People aren't looking through just a building to come in to see pretty lights, to hear a guy come and talk. They want to see life change. They want to see what God has done in you to believe that it can be done in them. They want to see passion. So God, we say, do it again in our city. But even more so than doing it again in our city, we have to see God do it again in our church. It has to start within these four walls. It has to start with us because we can't come and sit down and expect God to move someone else to be the change in the city that we want to see. How, how, how bold would it be of us to come and believe God to change the city but not be willing to do anything about it? How, how shameful would it be to say, God, we want to redeem a day known as Halloween, but we're not going to do anything to do it. God, we want to see change in this community. Father, we want to see broken lives mended. Father, we want to see people who have problems with their houses, problems with their lives, but we are not going to be part of the solution. How bold of us to believe that we can come and, and say, God, you're the God of miracles, but not be a part of the miracle. I'm not saying that Brookhaven First Assembly's name has to be stamped on everything that we do, but people have to know that if the lights go off in our building and the sign is taken down, that there's something missing because we made that kind of an impact in Brookhaven. Whether it's in up north part of Brookhaven, south part of Brookhaven, east part of Brookhaven, west part of Brookhaven, somewhere in our city, people have to know that this church loves them and cares about them and wants to be Jesus with skin on to them to let passion of God flow through them. It's got to start in our church. In fact, Paul writes to, to Timothy, Timothy being one of the leaders of the church of Ephesus. In his second letter, in chapter 4, verse 5, it says this, As for you, being Timothy, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Did you catch it? As for you, always be sober-minded, endure Endure, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Things weren't always great at the church of Ephesus. Just like things won't always be great here at BFA, there are going to be some times where you come and you have a bad day. It's because people are people. People are hurting. People are broken. People make mistakes. People make errors. And it may not be your day, but see, the mark of passion as the world would define it, is an instantaneous moment. Passion is not when you see a man and a woman leave a bar, go home, and have intimacy. No, that's an attraction in the moment. Passion is when you're able to do something even when it hurts. Passion is when you're able to share the gospel with someone even though you're not getting paid. Passion is when you step up and you go into a situation knowing you're going to get hurt, but you share the love of Jesus anyway because you know them knowing the love of Jesus is more important than the pain that you receive. Passion is going deeper. Passion transcends. In fact, Siri puts it this way. It blew my mind. Just one day I was looking at my phone and said, Siri, define passion to me. And the first line was, you know, a passionate moment, a, a moment of significance. But the second point just shocked me. It said the suffering that Jesus Christ endured on the cross. You see, to, to say that Jesus enjoyed going to the cross would be a fallacy. It hurt. But he was so passionate about you and me that he was willing to make the price, he was willing to pay the price to go and do it anyway. But even more so, more so than God do it in our city, more so than God do it through our church, there's a level that's even deeper. And we have to say, God, do it again through me. Say it with me, through me. Through me. You see, because it's easy to say, yeah, our church can do it. Brookhaven First Assembly is doing some great things. But if we're not invested in the moment, if we're not invested in reaching out and letting passion flow through us and passion interceding in our city, then we're not letting God use us to be a part of the change that we're hoping God to change in our city. We're not letting God use us to be a move of God. We're too busy waiting on a move of God instead of God letting us use us and becoming a move of God. Because I believe we can. We can be on two sides of the check mark. We can either be a part of a miracle or we can sit there and wait and look for a miracle. But I believe that if we would just get passionate and seek Jesus and trust him and do it again that we would be a part of the miracle.
But I love, I love this about God. I love this about God. He, he tells them what the problem was. He told the church of Ephesus what their error was and that they needed to turn from it. But he gave them the solution. Did you see what the solution was? Can you pull it back up? Revelations 2, verse 5. We'll start, well, actually, we'll start in verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. And do the works you did at first. And do it again. Do it again. Do it again. I'm reminded of a story. In 1940, it shared of Wheaton College taking a trip overseas to Europe. They were doing a study on John Wesley, and they went to his house. And they were doing a tour. As they were walking through the house, they came to his bedroom, in his prayer room. They noticed something very interesting about John Wesley. John Wesley was a powerful, powerful man of God father of the Methodist church, and he just done, had seen revival all throughout England. And it was an amazing, amazing move of God. And it was said that John Wesley prayed so much that you could literally see where he had prayed in the carpet. That he had prayed so much that his knees were actually etched into the ground. That's a man that prayed, amen? And in in this, this college, Wheaton College was coming through, and they were touring his building, and they saw, and they were, they were witnessing it, and they were going back to the bus, and the teacher was counting the students and making sure that everybody was there. They were just making sure, I mean, like every good teacher would, even though you have college kids, you have some college kids that aren't going to make it on the bus. The teacher notices that one kid's missing. Come on, man, you're in college. How are you going to be missing from the bus? You get on the bus, you're going to get left in England. You're from North Carolina. How are you going to get left in England? Well, the teacher goes back in the house, and he walks into the room, and he sees this young man, and he's praying in the very same spot that John Wesley was praying, and his prayer was this, oh, Lord, do it again. Do it again, God. Do it again, Lord. Please do it again. He was passionately praying a prayer to see the same outpouring, the same revival that happened in England to happen in the United States. The teacher came over and tapped him on the shoulder and said, come on, Billy, it's time to go. And he and Billy Graham loaded up on the bus to come back to the United States. Billy Graham went on to see God do it again. What's amazing is it wasn't the place where Billy Graham prayed. It wasn't that he was in John Wesley's house. Oh, no that he was passionately seeking the Spirit of God, seeking the heart of God to do it again. God, do it again. It's it's not about my agenda. It's not about what I want to see in this life. God, I want to see your Holy Spirit pour out across the Americas, and I want to see lives forever changed for the kingdom of God. God, do it again. And you may say, Matt, that's great, but we're nowhere near England. I wish we could go in the room and pray. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit doesn't wait on us to go pray in John Wesley's bedroom for him to answer. And in fact, tonight, if I could get personal with you, it's an emotional moment for me because I remember many of you have prayed in this building. And in fact, you prayed in the building before because BFA has been here for 82 years. And it's so easy to go back to the remember when and when I get caught up in the emotion, it's easy for me to go back to the remember when because I remember when my first Sunday at Brookhaven First Assembly, I was on this row right here. Not interested in Jesus, but all of interested in Christy. And and I remember when I started faithfully attending here, I sat in that back row back there. And it was Brother Stuart, he was here and he was teaching and he started off with some good jokes. And then I remember that as I started getting plugged in and, and really interested in what God wanted for my life, it was next door in the student life building when we had a red carpet and red pews and paneling on the walls. That was on the third row back on the left side that I gave my life to Christ and I let him come in and change me. And I remember when that in that same church at BFA that I went on a youth convention trip and I went to Southside Assembly in Jackson, safe part of town. 
And I remember being in the center aisle and the altar call was given and the baptism of the Holy Spirit invaded my life and forever changed me and equipped me and prepared me for what God had in the future. And I remember going my senior year of high school to Kosciuszko Campground and being in the room on the right side of the stage when God spoke clearly through my life, into my life through Mozart Dor, who's a mighty man of God, speaking of the things that I would see in the future. And I can go on the list of I remember wins. I remember we were doing a love series and I was sitting right here where Miss Connie was, but Miss Connie was not here. And we were doing a series on love. And on this platform, I proposed to Christy, and I remember just a year and a half later, I was standing in this spot right here, that God allowed me to marry the most beautiful woman in this world. And I remember being on this stage, dedicating my life. I remember preaching my first sermon here. I remember, I remember, I remember. And you remember. But we can't get so caught up in the I remembers that we miss God, do it again. God, do it again. Because we can get so caught up on what he did that we forget about the people that need it now, the city that needs it now, the people in our church that need it now, your personal life, you need it now. So God, do it again. But for God to do it again, we have to do it again. We have to get off the checklist. And we have to get about passionately seeking God. We have to be getting on our face, praying to God as a Father, as Lord, as King, as Savior, as Alpha and as Omega, as one that whom nothing shall be called impossible and saying, God, do it again. Do it again, Lord, do it again, because there was nothing special about Billy Graham other than his passion, wanting God to do something that God already wanted to do. My friends, the, the formula is the same. God's passion is there. God's love is there. His plan is still there. The only thing that changes is you and me. And whether we're willing to say, God, do it again, or church as usual. And friend, that miracle that you're seeking in your life, God's going to give it to you. But you got to seek him first. Pastor has spoken. He's taught, seek first the kingdom of God. And everything else will be added to you. What does the kingdom of God want? He wants his people to invade a city, to come united, voices together, young and old, black and white. It is whether you've been saved for 50 years or saved for five minutes. He's wanting his people, his chosen people. The one thing that we all can get passionate about, no matter our background, is Jesus. He's wanting people that love Jesus so much that they're willing to leave out those doors and step up to the plate and say, hey, can I tell you about the Lord of the universe? Can I tell you about the man who gave it all for you? Can I tell you about a guy who can take you from your brokenness and make you whole? Can I tell you about a guy that desires you and all of you. It's not about a building. It's not about a sermon series. It's not about coming in and listening to the piano and the guitar and the lights. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And if you need something in your life, you can easily have it, but you have to seek first the kingdom of God. You have to do the things that you formerly did. If we can remember when we used to praise God and that's feigned in our life now, that God is saying, do it again. Do what you did at first. Pray fast, worship, read my word, get lost in me and not in the world around you. To do it again. God, do it again. God, do it again. So where does it start? It starts with you and me. Right here, right now. It starts with you and me. Going to the throne of God. And repenting of areas in our life where we've put things above him and let our passion wane, even if it's good things, that can't be the number one. It's got to be our first love. And that first love is Jesus. Check this out. If we go back, Ephesians 1, 4 says this. Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, that word chose in the Greek, it's not just like, hey, I choose you. It's a passionate possession. It's like that one in a million. It's like Jesus choosing the 12 disciples. It's like God choosing you for significant purpose. It's, it's a passionate choosing. 
You see, God's already chose you. He desires you. He wants you. It's up to you and us, you and me, you and I. If we want to see God do it again, we got to do it again. And I want to welcome you. We may not be in John Wesley's room, but praise God, we have an altar of the Lord. Praise God, we have a spot where we can come and seek his face. And I want to invite you now to come. Come, find a place here at the front. Find a place to stand. We're going to take a few moments in prayer, and I want to challenge you to pray for things in your life specifically. I want to challenge you to pray that God would reawaken that fire in you. And before you seek the miracle, before you seek God moving in the situation, I want you to say, God, seek in me. Change me. Transform me. Let that fire reignite in me. Show me where I can do it again. Because God, at the end of the day, I want you to do it again. Friends, there is plenty of room. There is plenty of room. I believe God's heart and his desire is for us to come together as friends, as family, passionately seeking him. Whether you need to sit on the front row, whether you need to lay at the altar, whether you need to stand in his presence, whatever it is, this time is for you. And if you're not able to come forward, that is completely understandable. God can move where you are. But I would just ask that you would check your heart and that you would say, Holy Spirit, challenge me. Check me. Do I need to repent? And if you do, let it go. Just turn away from it. And then say, God, I love you. I'm passionate for you. God, I'm seeking you with my whole heart. And God, I'm asking you to do it again in me. And Father, do it again in this city. Do it again in this church. Father, do it again in this nation that we would see an outpouring of your Holy Spirit like never before. Oh, come on, man of God. Come on, woman of God. Lift up your voice. Lift it up in adoration. Praise the King of kings. Praise the Lord of lords. Let him know you love him. Let him know you care about him. Let him know you are here for him, that your first love is him. Let him know that you're coming back to a heart of worship. Let him know that it's about him tonight. It's not about programs. It's not about a sermon. It's not about anything but Jesus. Because if we don't get Jesus right, it's all for naught. Holy Spirit, I ask that your presence would come and fill this place. Oh, Father, that it would be like the upper room in Acts 2, Jesus, that your Holy Spirit would come in like a rushing wind. And, Father, that we would see a power like never before invade us and transform us, God, because we're seeking you. And, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would draw in us, fan into flame, a gift in us, Father, to take your name to Brookhaven, Mississippi. And, Father, that we would break out from these four walls, that this church would be known not for the building, but for the name that we represent for you, that we would share your love, your passion, your grace, your mercy. Father, that we would exhibit the fruit of the Spirit everywhere we go. And Father, I pray that as our light shines for you in Brookhaven, God, that it would change this state, it would change this nation, and it would change this world. And Father, that you would do it again right here in Brookhaven, Mississippi. Father, in this room that you're already beginning to transform and change and challenge lives. Oh, Father, we come for you. We come for you. We lift your praises up. We lift your honor up. Father, we're falling in love with you all over again. God, change us. Change us from the inside. Father, we're not focused on what you can do for other people. God, we're focusing on how you're changing us so we can be used by you to change other people. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. You're welcome here. You're welcome here. The worship team is going to lead us in a few songs of worship. And if you're done praying, I just want you to lift up some praise to God the Father. I want you to lift up praise to Jesus. And I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life, to continue to change you, to let those dry bones come back to life and let the breath of God enter you. And that a passion for Him will surpass all other things. Oh, Holy Spirit, come.